The uh, radical trans movement, the transgender movement, it's being pushed back, but not here yet. In Britain, the National Health Service has banned gender identity clinics from giving puberty blockers to children. Now, puberty blockers do things like they stop girls from developing breasts. They stop boys from getting facial hair with uh, uh, puberty. And this comes after a, a damning review led by Dr Hilary Cass in 2020 of gender identity services for children in Britain. And the results were shocking. She said there just wasn't enough evidence for a start about what these drugs were actually doing to children and young people, or if they even help. And then you also had people, some have been on the show, who've gone through the whole process, even later having their breasts removed or their genitals surgically removed or changed. They were saying, look, they regretted the whole thing. And whistleblowers in gender identity clinics lately have been saying children have been pushed into getting this so-called treatment. There is absolutely no way that these patients were in the right mental place to be able to make any long-term decisions about their health, let alone um, decisions about gender transitioning as a child. Joining me is Andrew Amos, who's an academic psychiatrist who co-authored a paper in the journal Australasian Psychiatry. We've talked about that before, a paper warning that there was too much politics and not enough science in helping children change gender. Uh, Andrew Amos, thanks for joining us again. How important is this decision in Britain? Oh, G'day, Andrew. Look, I think the decision to ban puberty blockers in England would turn out to be crucial in England, but also in Australia. It's obviously good news for English kids who will no longer be put at risk of serious physical and psychological harms, but even more important, it'll interrupt the gender-affirming treadmill that drags confused young people away from normal development and towards a lifetime of harmful medic medications and surgeries. So that's good news for the English kids. But to put this in context, it's been reported that right now there's only about 100 English kids on puberty blockers at all. And I've got a new paper coming out that reports a massive increase in the number of Australian kids being given um, puberty blockers. So in 2023, for example, 172 kids were started on puberty blockers in the Queensland public health system alone. Now, it's difficult to know exactly how many kids are affected across Australia's public and private systems, because we essentially had to use freedom of information requests to get any data on this. But it has to be at least many hundreds more each year. So it's a big problem in Australia and it's getting worse. So Britain's got two and a half times our population. It's only got 100 Indeed. kids on this. We have got hundreds. I mean, that's just extraordinary. I want to pick you up on something you said. Damaged, vulnerable children uh, are being treated. This worries me. You know, the way it's often presented in the media, they're happy, well-adjusted children from good homes, uh, loving homes, and they know they're pretty wise to what's going on and they make a conscious, rational decision. I'm in the wrong body. I want to change. What sort of children are we really talking about? Look, it's a really good question. Uh, one of the big problems in this area, of course, is that the advocates have done such a good job at preventing quality research. We're probably widely underestimating the number of kids who are being diagnosed with uh, other serious psychiatric conditions instead of or as well as gender dysphoria. So many of these kids turn out to have other serious psychiatric problems including autism, but also personality disorders, bipolar disorder, psychosis. So one of the more interesting theories about gender confusion is that it has more to do with early trauma, particularly sexual abuse, and with home environments that don't enforce traditional boundaries than it does with any inborn characteristics of individual kids. So, so what that means and what the English ban is intended to do is to allow scientists to start answering some of these questions before we implement these very damaging and lifelong medication uh, and surgical procedures. Also lets the children mature and think longer and harder and as they get hopefully wiser and get more psychiatric help, et cetera, maybe. Because I, I, I remember uh, I interviewed Hannah Barnes, who wrote a, a, a BBC journalist who wrote a book about all this, about the scandal in Britain, uh, and yes. in her book, uh, it says, uh, she reports that up to a third of children at a Tavistock unit were autistic, for instance. Many were from broken homes. I mean, we, these are vulnerable children. The question is, why do you think trans, you know, changing gender as if that's, you know, if that's possible, 
has been pushed so hard even on such vulnerable children? Where, where does the politics come from? Well, look, um, that's a very complicated question, but the basic reason this is so political is because gender-affirming advocates have made a very strategic use of medical systems in Western countries to bypass usual medical safeguards, and they're really pushing a political point of view. So essentially uh, what's happened in Australia is activist clinicians, often identifying as transgender themselves, have realised that a very small number of highly motivated doctors can take over the decision-making process at medical colleges like my college psychiatrists. And that allows them to, then to endorse whatever medical practices they like using the college as a mouthpiece, essentially. So once a few medical colleges in Australia endorsed what's called the gender-affirming care model, which is what's used for, um, to justify puberty blockers, um, essentially then, uh, and this occurred about five or six years ago, Australian hospitals and health systems then started to implement it, even though there was no good evidence for it. So once that happens, courts start to describe it as the standard of care and health bureaucracies enshrine it in their protocols. Okay. So now, yeah, now that it has sort of legal and bureaucratic armour, it's really going to take a concerted effort by politicians with a lot more uh, than usual courage to pass legislation that will reverse these bad decisions and to ignore the fierce criticism that they'll get from uh, very vocal ab activists. And yeah, well, the courage, yes, the courage comes from being called, uh, you know, a bigot, a heartless, uh, a transphobe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, and don't forget, uh, you know, I was talking to a professional dealing with uh, some trans girls that thought they were transgender. Um, I'm told, you know, it's almost like a fashion among children that are feeling the lost at school way of getting attention as well. Let's not forget that. But, oh, what consequences. Andrew Amos, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.